I usually want to take the more kind of the gentler approach because we just don't want to be seen to be, you know, doing too much marketing, right? No one likes that. Episode 147. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, we have got very special guest, Dave Sharp from Vanity Projects, one of the gurus of marketing for architects. He's absolutely brilliant if you're not already following some of his content and webinars. And it was a real delight to speak with Dave. He's got a you know, background in architecture, a master's degree in architecture. So he understands the thinking and the mindset of architectural practices. And he is a lover of all things social media, um, digital marketing strategies. And in this conversation, um, we get really tactical, right? We go into a number of different ways of how architects can be generating referrals, how they can be powerfully using social media, um, paid for advertising, uh, and you know, really being able to increase the amount of referrals that you're going to be getting in your practice. Um, we discuss some of the problems that architects typically face with, with marketing, some of their obstacles, challenges, and some of the mindsets as well that often keep us from fully engaging with the marketing side of our business. Dave has worked with around 100 different clients. Um, he really knows his stuff. I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking with him. And this is, I think, one of the most interesting and very a hugely valuable podcast here. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Dave Sharp of Vanity Projects. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Dave, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Very good. Thanks, Rian. Thank you so much for having me on. It's an honor. My absolute pleasure. It's about time that we've had you on. Yes. You are the guru of all things marketing <laughs> for architects, social media. Um, you're one of these names that every time I'm speaking to an architect, who's you know, when I've been interviewing people on the show, and we're talking about where their marketing came from. Like I was chatting to Amos recently, yeah. old Rick. And he was saying, oh, Dave Sharp. Well, I worked with Dave. So absolutely well, thank pleasure. You. <laughs> pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, for, finally... thank you for setting such high expectations. I hope, <laughs> I, hope I, could, I hope I could deliver and maybe come back as a guest in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. So I'm curious to know, you've obviously you've got a background in architecture. You studied architecture and then you went over to the dark arts of persuasion and, and entered into the world of marketing. How did that transition happen? Yeah, so, so I, did, I did have the background in architecture. It was a pretty short background in architecture. So I, I started studying uh, it straight out, of, straight out of high school, straight into architecture just absolutely going for it. I thought I was going to be the next hot thing in architecture, like everyone does at the beginning, right? Yeah. Um, and then as I went on, I got more experience. I started working in small practices. I kept kind of grinding away at the degree and making progress on that front. But I was finding myself drawn towards certain aspects of the industry, more of the business side and the communication side. And that stuff interested me so much. How do you talk about architecture? How do you share it, photograph it, all that sort of stuff. And I was kind of, you know, this might just be my laziness. I was finding myself less and less drawn to the actual, the work <laughs> of, of yeah. being an architect and doing architecture. And um, so I started finding these more sort of outside interests, um, looking at other areas of what architects were doing. And then when I was working in practices and I went and took a bit of a gap year between my undergrad and my and my master's and I went to Japan and I spent half a year in this Japanese architecture firm and just got all these really cool practice experiences. But when it came down to it towards the end, I thought, oh, I just, I just really am so interested in business and marketing. And so during my final stages of my master's of architecture, I started, um, 
I started building a bit of a reputation as kind of a social media guy um, right. it, uh, in the in the local architecture scene, um, just amongst a few of the architects I knew in in Perth in Western Australia. And I started helping some local architects with their Instagram accounts. And Instagram was all kind of new and interesting and exciting back then. And everyone was like, "What is this thing? How do we? What do we do?" But I knew I knew what was going on with it, so I started helping. And and by the time I finished my degree, I I had like a little just like a little book of clients that I was doing social media services before as a kind of a side hustle. Mm. Um, but then my, my partner who was also an architect, she got offered a job in Melbourne and we decided to move and I was kind of starting from scratch. And I just thought, Hey, I'm, I've got this opportunity, completely new situation, new environment. Maybe I should start to explore this side hustle a little bit more and, and start to develop that. So I basically making barely any money at all at that point, but I just decided to go full time. I had like five clients that I was helping with their Instagram accounts. And then it just kind of went from there. So now I kind of operate under vanity projects in my name. But at that time I was Instagram for architects and that was like really my focus. It was very, it was I think I'm niche now. I was even more niche then. <laughs> just, just like, like, just looking so at Instagram. You've you broadened your scope of services since. I, I feel like I'm as broad as I could possibly be right now compared to then. But, but yeah, and it just grew, and, and, and my services changed, and and my approach changed as I learned more, and I started to get to know a lot more clients and and what they needed help with, and and it sort of evolved gradually to the point that where that it's at now. Amazing, and so. If you were to define what marketing is, how would you how would you explain it to somebody who doesn't have the concept of what marketing is? Because obviously, in architecture school and as a a practicing architect, we we have an idea of what it is, but often that's not the reality. For you, how would you how would you define marketing? Yeah, it's tough to it, it, defining marketing for architects is kind of interesting. Like I have I have my podcast marketing for architects or the architecture firm marketing podcast right it's in on the cover it should all be about marketing but we don't really spend a lot of time talking about marketing Mm -hmm. and i actually find that when i speak to architects that i like that i think market themselves well they describe themselves as good communicators and that's what i when i hear that i'm like oh that's marketing for me it's it's not it's not just about the social media channels or the website or traffic or leads or any of those things. It's sort of a bit more than that in the architecture space. And it is really about, I think, how do you communicate what you're doing? And sometimes that is about communicating like the unique aspects of what you're doing that are different to other architects. But a lot of the time, I think the architects that market themselves really well are actually just do a really good job of explaining, you know, what makes architecture so great in general. And they have Mm -hmm. this really good ability to get, get people excited about architecture and the idea of working with an architect. And so like, not really like a succinct definition of marketing, but I think it, it has aspects of, of those things, but I think in architecture, it, I, I, I see it as kind of a communication thing more than anything. I love that definition. It's being able to get people excited about working with an architect. Yeah. I think that's a lovely, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. That's, that's a lovely description. Um, what is a good communicator of architecture? What do the what are they the sort of things that they do? You know, it's 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 funny. Um, it's not necessarily about the execution for me. Like I work, I get to see a lot. I work with a lot of architects, right? And some of them are really great communicators. Some of them are like still learning, and some are just at the beginning. They're not really sure how to do that. And so I, I sort of see what are the more accomplished communicators, and I think that they are the people that. Um, they're, they're excited, they're passionate, they're consistent, there's some frequency around what they're doing. And, you know, you might love them or hate them, you might be sick of seeing them, whatever, but they're out there, they're, they're, they're like looking, they're excited to share what they're doing with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, they're generous, uh, they, they are thinking at all times, like, what can I what can I give away to other people? What can I what can I show them that they'll think is interesting? What could I teach somebody that I know that they might not know or would surprise them? There's just this really, um, I know it sounds a bit whatever, but this kind of this giving attitude that I think makes them quite a good communicator. And they're they're patient and they're kind of, as they say, giving without expectation. I'm not sure that might be a Gary Vaynerchuk thing, but doing a lot of that, doing yes. a lot of I'm not looking for every single thing I post or share or 
you know, submit to a publication to be this transactional thing where I expect a certain amount of new business in return on every single one of these transactions, yeah. which is a mentality that makes people very bad communicators, I think. Whereas there's sort of the good, the better communicators are just like, you know what? Like, I, I know that I, this is the right thing. It's going in the right direction and I'm doing my best. I'm giving away, I'm sharing my enthusiasm, I'm sharing what I'm doing. And yeah, they're, they're, there's a little bit of that faith in there that I think makes them a good communicator well, as well. <laughs> well that, that's really interesting as well, is kind of uh, managing as a practitioner or someone who's producing content or using these platforms is how do you encourage architects to manage those expectations? Because obviously social media can become uh, a, a big, t- it can, if not done effectively or with strategy, a very time-consuming thing. And often some people... Um, dare I say, some of the older architects that I speak with, um, a- approaching or using social media can be really challenging. And unless they get somebody else to do it in the office, um, how do you manage expectations? So it's not kind of, you know, what, why are you doing it? Yeah, very difficult to manage expectations sometimes. It takes a lot of conversation to kind of get get an architect to a point where they might start having a kind of a different outlook on things. Mm -hmm. It really depends on whether they're lacking for work, right? So if they're in a situation where they're looking at marketing as we're kind of, we've we've really undermarketed ourselves and now we're in this sort of tricky situation where we really need more work. um, That's quite difficult. You, You may actually just need to actually uh, focus on marketing, I guess, tactics or channels that are probably not really that much about communication or building a brand that aren't going to be that long-term initially. So you might actually focus on some more short-term things. Say, for example, doing like running a little bit of advertising, collecting some email addresses, doing those sorts of more more sort of direct response marketing strategies. Mm -hmm. That will usually get them to a point where they're going, great, now there is at least some engagement. They're starting to see that. And that sort of takes away that fear factor, I think, of, oh, no, we're not getting any interest. There's no leads at all. There's nothing to work with here, which can be very stressful, I think, for anybody that's running a business when you're kind of the leads are sort of, you don't have any new opportunities. That can be very frightening. And your brain doesn't work properly when you're frightened, right? So you're stressed and you're frightened and you're going, you're not making rational decisions. And that's, that if, uh, it, I don't. I don't even have the willpower to deal with those situations. Yeah. But once those leads are there, then you can start to talk about quality and client quality because everybody wants to work with better quality clients. And you actually don't need your marketing doesn't have to. It, it as as it starts to become more successful, you will get to the point where you feel as though you're getting more leads than you can really deal with. Mm-hmm. That that will happen quite. Not, not that long away. Like it doesn't actually take that much success to achieve that level. But then there becomes this really strong desire. We want that quality to improve. So then you can start to have a conversation about, you know, you, you want to educate these, these leads or these prospects on these potential clients. These could be your new clients. You have this opportunity to maybe teach them how they should possibly behave or think. And maybe if you're lucky, you can kind of mold them into really good quality clients by the time they come to work with you rather than hoping that they're just come, going to come in the door perfectly, mm-hmm. exactly matching with you. So that can sometimes be, a, I've found can be quite a good motiv- motivator or it can be that sort of like epiphany that makes you realize that maybe my communication, aside from just promoting projects, but in terms of maybe more forms of content marketing, it, it could just be about going, what are the things I would like to model for my clients or each new client that comes to me, what would I like them to think or know? And how, how would I like to sort of educate them and get them more in line with us prior to them coming to us? And I think that can actually set like a pretty clear mission for mm-hmm. directors who don't necessarily see, they sort of think of posting stuff on the internet as very like frivolous. Yeah, um, or, or it's a nebulous activity that's not going to have much r- direct results. So it's e- difficult. Exactly, to- exactly. But I would even just start from, you know, uh, working. I was working with a client this week on they had started running some ads and now they were getting some emails and coming through their website. And uh, we were we were kind of going, well, 
now we can start sending them some emails. So what are we going to email them, right? We've got their emails. Now what are we going to do? So it turned into this conversation of, you know, what as far as the things that would make you happiest when you have that initial conversation with these clients, what would maybe the three things you would love them to say the most be? (laughs) And maybe it's something towards, you know, I think, I think it's more about quality than quantity. Maybe that would really be nice to hear as an architect, if that client was saying that, or, you know, I'm really just, I'm, I I want to entrust this design process to you. You're the expert, (laughs) like whatever. I'm just, you know, whatever you want them to be saying. And then I was thinking with this client about, well, let's actually think about maybe three short articles that make a really good case for why, why a client should think that way. And then that starts to become, you know, something that, a, something that an architect can think about and go, I see, I see something kind of concrete to that, but that's just kind of one example. But I think it can be a starting point where you start to see what's the actual purpose because mm. the purpose of the content, you know, it, it may not be to get us more clicks to our web. Like you're not going to be thinking about driving traffic or getting more followers. If you're thinking about that sort of stuff, I mean, what kind of content are you going to create? It's going to be rubbish, right? Yeah. So, but but if you think more about, you know, I just want to, what are the ideas that I kind of want to get a, get out of my own head and get across to other people that would help me? Because, you know, that's what I'm really looking for is that like-mindedness. Mm-hmm. Then that could, be, that could be a good starting point. Brilliant. Okay. So just to back up a little bit there. So in, in yeah. terms of like generating leads, let's say we've got a, fi- a, fictional, a fictional client of yours, for example. Mm. Yeah. And the first thing that you're getting them to do is to use Instagram and Facebook ads. I'm assuming one of those types of channels to to, yeah. st- to start generating leads. What's the strategy there? How do you use that? Mm, so it, it depends what stage that they're at. Now it's, I would say that not all, not even close to all of my clients. So I'd say right. probably about half of my clients would be doing some form of some small form of paid advertising. The great thing about, doing some sort of Instagram, Facebook ads is that you can start with a pretty small budget and your ads don't even need to be ads, right? They don't necessarily have to be strictly about getting leads or whatever. You could just look at it as basically, I can take my projects or my stuff about whatever I've designed so far, whatever work I want to promote, and I can be so specific about who I promote them to, which is just it's a really nice tool for architects that haven't built like a really big reputation, but in terms of like more of that lead generation driven stuff um, there, let's imagine that we've got a client who is very early stage. They haven't even finished a built project yet. Mm -hmm. What are they supposed to do? (laughs) Right. As far as, as far as ads. So we might talk about, well, what if you were to, what if you were to maybe even invest in getting some really good, renders or visualization of your unbuilt project that might be 12 months away, but it will be really helpful for you if you've got images of that, that you can market with right now. Yeah. So maybe we put that out there and we might simply say, you know, we might target people in the area that that project is and say more information is going to be, you know, dropping about this project soon, like sign up to get that information. And look, that's not going to be somebody who's ready to build tomorrow, Yeah. but it's going to be a starting point of people in that area who like your work, who are signing up to follow along with that story. So that could be where you're being patient and you're thinking you're playing the long game, but nonetheless, that can be an audience of people that are really useful. Um, The other things that clients will do is they might, if they've got like a specific focus and and I'm thinking about what do my UK clients love? They love passive house. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, and I'm thinking about one firm in particular who is, is, is doing this and I won't name them, but, um, but you know, they have done that sort of strategy of putting together basically like a bit of a, a briefing document that's kind of a helpful conversation starter for clients. And they spent a lot of time working on it and put some, they basically sort of simplified the kind of conversations they have with their clients initially. And they created all these sections for, for people to fill out, kind of have that discussion in their family. What do we want to achieve? And um, they really framed it around this idea of like, they, they, they put that out there and go, you complete this. It's a really helpful document. And then you can always like discuss with us, your answers, any questions that you were like stuck with. So there's a lot of potential follow-up from that. So that's another example of something that they can, you can promote as an ad. But um, 
Otherwise, you know, I'm always, I feel like as a marketing person, I have a tendency to try and overcomplicate things. I've also had clients that have just done like the cardinal sin with, with social media advertising, which is they've just taken their latest project and gone, this is such and such house in this area. It, it is this and described it. And they've just pointed the Instagram ads at their homepage, which isn't supposed to achieve anything in the, you know, in the, uh, the, the academics of how you're meant to run ads, right? But I've had clients that have done that. They've just gone ahead and done it. We haven't even discussed it. And they've come back and told me that they've got like a significant number of leads from doing that. And so it's honestly, it's situations like that when my clients like completely upstage me that make yeah. me, the, <laughs> just so like, oh, making me the most okay. upset. <laughs> but I write it down, then I tell my other clients. So at the end of the day, <laughs> exactly, at the end of the day, exactly I'm happy. Does. But I'm like, thank you. Thank you for exploring that tactic for me. Much appreciated. That's, but, that's um, <laughs> the beauty of working with numerous people. Is you're yeah, like, ah, ex- okay. you, you do. You do get like working at any given time. I might be working with 30 to 40 different practices in melbourne um around australia the uk america so i get this like really good little window into uh into what everybody's doing and it's also really great when somebody does go and try something that you know they they, you know they just go you know off and do their own thing for a little bit and then Mm -hmm. they come back and tell me something that didn't work didn't work and then this worked great and i'm like finally fantastic that's great news um, amazing amazing okay so instagram and facebook ads are actually a pretty nifty way of just starting to generate leads um and, and what you're saying is that the the quality can be quite quite varied in terms of when you're using those platforms or i mean i i would say compared to what right um mm. can, can, any form of like online marketing will oftentimes it'll come as a shock to practices haven't really done much online marketing that when it's, when they do, and it finally starts working, they'll be saying, Hey, half these leads that we're getting, uh, no good. Um, we're used to pretty much everybody that calls us is like a pretty good fit most of the time. Yeah. And they come in and meet us and we get along and we give them a fee proposal and we go ahead. A big part of the reason that like normal word of mouth is like generally high caliber clients is that they're kind of pre-filtered by the fact that they were introduced by your existing clients. And if you've got a good kind of group of clients and they're telling their, you know, best friends, you've got to work with this architect, you're usually getting pretty like similar groups of people. When you are going out online and marketing, it it is like, obviously you're reaching, you can't target so much to the point that you're not going to get anybody, uh, you're, that you're going to avoid getting some people that are, you know, uh, probably not ideal. But that would only be to say ideal for the moment. I Mm -hmm. still think that it's worthwhile for you to still consider each person that's taken an interest in your company as something that can develop over the long term. Maybe one, two, three years, that particular individual who may not be suitable right now, but who's to say what position they might be in a couple of years' time. Not to mention that if you communicate well to them, you treat them well, you're generous with those people, you don't know how many people they're going to tell about you as well. And quite often I see that one of the big factors um, that really makes a lot of a lot of architects online marketing successful is that the people that they're marketing to online are going off and telling other people. And I hear that a lot from architects, particularly when it comes to, you know, Instagram, for example, Um, you, you might ask, well, do you find you get a lot of clients from your Instagram audience? And quite often they'll say yes, but a lot of the time what I hear is, not directly, but almost everybody that comes to me, somebody who follows me on Instagram told them to come see me. So it's, interesting. you know, so there's that kind of, that kind of stuff to it. Interesting. Sure. Really interesting. And obviously this is about kind of, yeah, creating engaged engagement with your followers and audience that they end up talking about yeah. you and recommending you. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've certainly heard that as well, that people who are engaged with social media content, who are good at putting stuff out, they might say, yeah, not directly, but I know that people have had conversations from me that other people who are watching our stuff or, you know, they've found out about us at some point and then they've started following us and then they've been, you know, just building the relationship on social media over, mm-hmm. over time. Great. So nurturing those leads, educating clients, how, how does email marketing fit into this? Oh, I've become such a, like, I've become so bullish on email marketing over the last 
year or so. I didn't give it the time of day, honestly. Um, any 16 months ago, oh, I guess time's gone a bit weird right now, hasn't it? But in the last two years, it's become so <laughs> significant. <laughs> don't know where 2020 went, but prior to that, yeah, I really wasn't focusing it on focusing on it too much with my clients. I was so social media focused. Mm-hmm. Like it was always about how do we grow that audience? How do we get more people aware of your architecture firm or your practice? How do we do that? And getting published and, and doing all those sorts of things. Um, and that was how we perceived that that was the right way to go. But it's become, I think, increasingly clear over the last couple of years that you really can't rely on your Instagram audience or your Twitter audience or, God forbid, your Facebook audience to be the people that you're going to be able to have access to and be able to reach with your posts. Mm-hmm. Um, we need we need that sort of, we need that backup plan. And people have been saying that forever. Um, but, you know, on the one hand, you were saying it, but still actively putting all your eggs in social media in right. that one basket. So email has become a backup, I think. Um, but also it's just, yeah, it's just something that, gives you that consistency where if people want to open your emails, they can. You know that they're arriving. Unless something's really wrong with your domain name or whatever, your emails are reaching their destination. Now, does the person on the other end want to open them? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. That's totally up to them. But you know that you're going to get there and you just don't get that with social media anymore. Um, I, I, I work with architects that have very, very, very big audiences and their strategy has barely changed one bit, but they're just not finding that that same engagement is there. You know, they, they generally, they, they'll speak to people that they know follow them and say, did you see this? Did you see that? And they're like, no, I didn't, unfortunately. Now stories might make it, is, is kind of the last remaining, you know, bastion of where you can actually communicate to your followers. And I think stories is really, really awesome on, yeah. on Instagram, but you're yeah, a fan but of, just none of reels. I'm a fan of TikTok. <laughs> yes. TikTok so, is my favorite. Yeah. 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 So I love TikTok. Um, haven't found any way to really apply it to, to my client work yet. I'm, I'm probably going to be late to the party on that, but yeah, no reels as well is very, is, is very cool. I've got nothing against reels whatsoever. I would generally, I mean, it's, it's kind of conventional wisdom at this point that you generally want to look at the newer parts of any of these apps to try and think about what you should be doing right. Because the, o- the older parts, so the, mm-hmm. the original Instagram feed, you know, every man and their dog is posting 15 photos a day that they've scheduled up on, on Instagram. There's, and people are following 300, 400, 500 different accounts. Half of them, they're like, when did I even start following this account? It's just become, I think, overwhelming for people in terms of um, there's just too much content in that feed portion of the app. But yeah. stories, reels, IGTV, um, soon there'll probably be like a clubhouse feature for Instagram with like audio live conversations, Instagram live stories. There's a lot of features that take a lot of effort. A lazy marketer can't really do them effectively. So you're at a competitive advantage if you're willing to put in a bit of effort. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff there. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. So going back, going back to, to email, what makes a good mm. email strategy then? Say you've, you've generated leads using Facebook or Instagram ads. Yep. You've done a little bit and you, you know, you're, you're putting half decent content out. Um, what's, what goes into a good email marketing strategy for an architect? So, I, the, 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 part, the part that scares all of my, when I first introduce, there comes a point in time where I introduce email marketing to my clients and I have to do it very delicately <laughs> because nobody wants to do it because every single architect at one point in time has like created a MailChimp account, started collecting emails and then never sent them an email. So we're kind of, we have this like negative past experience of, oh, we tried that. And that was like a commitment that we didn't end up living up to that quarterly email, that monthly email that we were supposed to do. So Mm -hmm. firstly, if you're an architect, email is a frightening subject. So just I, what I try to do is firstly put aside the newsletter concept or the ongoing email concept and say, let's work on that second, but just forget about that for now, because there's other aspects to email marketing that are worth focusing on first. So Firstly, what I'd like to do with an architect is work out, do you have any interesting writing or content? Maybe that's interviews, videos, articles, anything you've created that would be interesting 
to send to somebody the first, when they first join your list um, that would give them a, a good introduction to your thinking, to your work, to all that stuff and who you are, your personality could just be like a fun video or one of those amazing like practice profiles that some practices are lucky to have made for them, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, do we have anything like that? And a lot of the times the answer is no. So we know that we're going to need to develop that kind of content. And I spoke earlier a little bit about that kind of, you know, persuasive sort of content that you can kind of work on. Uh, but at the very beginning, initially, we know that we want to send at least a welcome email so that there will be an email that gets delivered pretty much the moment somebody joins the list. And that can just be a single message that kind of is that personal hello from the director, from the team that gives that brief sort of overview of what the practice is about and maybe gives them, gives them some links to some things that they could go off and read. Maybe they're not complete interviews, but maybe it's just, here's a couple of recent things that we've, you know, that have been out there about us and here's our Instagram account. We do post pretty often over there. You should definitely check that out. And, one of our, you know, team members has a really great, you know, is raising money for some charity marathon. You should go follow that. So you could just start to add all this sort of stuff in there and make it that sort of that welcome pack. Mm -hmm. And I find that that can be just a really good starting point just for new subscribers. And you can do that inside of any email marketing thing, whether it's MailChimp or ConvertKit or SendGrid or whatever, you know, any one of them, you can do that sort of thing. Um, so that, that welcome email is key. Then we start thinking about those sort of, how do we add that second email that follows on from that a week later and the, or two weeks after that, or three weeks after that. And that's where those inside of MailChimp, it's called journeys or automations, or, you know, they're always changing what it's called, but building that sequence of emails that get delivered on a schedule of, you know, seven days, 14 days. That's usually where I, where I start focusing because, right. okay. Yeah. So- so, so, so having a well, a well thought out kind of planned campaign almost as soon as somebody enters into the email list so that you're, and then it's just, and it's I mean, just set and it's automated and it's the same it, thing. It, every it time. lets you, if you're particularly, if you've built up or if you then build up enough content, it takes, it really takes the pressure off you to have to worry about, I need to send another email mm-hmm. ASAP, right? Because in the conventional setup, they join the list and then, I mean, imagine you sent your last email yesterday. Cool. They're not going to get another email from you for four months, right? By that point, they're getting your email and going, oh, who the hell is this, right? It's, it's like you've completely disappeared at that point. But that automated sequence, we can kind of curate that initial experience. They, you know, they, they use the word onboarding. Like what is that onboarding experience like into our brand? Um, I, think, I think it's also, you know, important to give them a way to catch up because, Hey, like they just might have come to your website from Google yesterday and they didn't know you the day before that. So they didn't see that amazing project you did a year ago. And that time you got featured in Architect Journal, you know, two years ago. They didn't, they weren't there for that. So like do them a favor and give them like, let me get you up to speed on like what we're what we're kind of doing. Um, so once you've done that, you want to build up your kind of sequence from there. And then we start turning your attention more to those ongoing emails that we want to be sort of working out a really a simple strategy around that, that will allow us to hopefully send emails a little bit more frequently um, than what you might've done in the past, which might've just been too much work. Um, so try to simplify things from then on. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts on kind of the old school newsletters, like hard copy newsletters and taking, taking a digital strategy and I'm, I'm it, honestly just not that old. <laughs> honestly, I don't think I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever received a physical newsletter in my entire life. But I, it sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> I honestly, in 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 you know, always a fan of like doing the opposite or whatever mm-hmm. whatever everyone else is doing, um, and taking advantage of that. So I think something like that could be a really good idea. I mean, if there are people sending physical newsletters, I would love to know about it. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Now, this is, this is something we, we've I've spoken to before with some with marketers and some of the clients that we work with. Um, physical newsletters, and often you know, like a hand a handwritten note, for example, wow. on, the, on the newsletter, but doing it to a much smaller group of people. So obviously, you, you're not the same sort of target audience or or breadth, if you like, but smaller, much yeah. more focused. I think so. I think that that would work really, really well for an established business that really just. Um, 
I mean, that could work well for anybody. I wouldn't discourage anybody from doing something like that or at least giving it a go. Um, I think it would be particularly, you know, relevant for a, a practice that has built really long lasting relationships with some mm. very important people who are particularly valuable in terms of referring them business and have, you know, if you're in that kind of business where you go, you know, this person has sent me so many projects over the years and you've got people like that in your network, then that could be, I think, a really nice strategy. And yeah, it doesn't have to be large numbers of people. And I mean, going maybe even going back to email for a second, I don't think it has to be about large numbers for people. Right. I, I honestly, like I might be working with a new client, helping them to sort of get their email list established and organized. And they, they might say, well, I've only, you know, I've just started my practice recently. I've only got maybe like 35 contacts and half of these people are my friends and family. Um, I'm starting from nowhere, but it's like, don't you like, don't you want to, you want to message those people, right? Maybe not the, maybe not the friends and family as much, but that, you know, that handful of potential Maybe they were potential clients. Maybe they're people that you sent fee proposals to. Maybe they're um, builder, a builder that you worked with or a, a colleague at a previous practice who could possibly refer you some smaller projects that they aren't really doing anymore. Like there's a lot of people, even if it's small numbers, it's still so important to keep in touch with them. And yeah. it's much better to keep in touch with them with like a nice tightly organized email list than hoping that they're going to catch your next Instagram post or that they're going to buy the next copy of uh, whatever magazine and come across your article in it. You need that. Yeah, absolutely. Being, being strategic with your, with your audience and knowing who's your network, who's in there. How do you, how do you advise clients to kind of audit their network, if you like, to sort of identify people who could be those referral partners yeah, what's well, interesting with the referral specifically, um, I, I, I ask like this is again one of those things that my clients hate doing, but I have to like I have to beg them to do it, and then they do it. But it's like actually go through because these contacts are like they're like finding needles in a haystack. The way mm. that they're tracked in most architecture practices, like most architecture small architecture practices, don't maintain CRMs. Um, they don't have like a system for keeping track of those contacts. So what we usually have, can you is explain like, what a CRM is for people? Who yeah. Don't so know CRM, what cus- I, what's, what's the abbreviation customer relationship manager, I guess, management. Um, the basic idea is a database or sometimes it's an app, um, that you load in contacts and information about them. And you try and feed in information about how recently you've contacted them. What form did that contact take? And they become this helpful system for, you know, surfacing potential actions that you should be taking as like a salesperson or as a director. So you might start to establish some rules for yourself of when people are at this stage of the process, maybe, um, maybe there, maybe there's a past client category and that's the stage that they're at. I need to set some rules in there about how often I contact them and what form that contact takes. And then this will be a good way of keeping on top of those of those processes that you want to have in place. Um, A CRM is just going to help to organize things. So I think that's the first step, whether it's just a spreadsheet or whether you use a tool, there's, uh, I like streak. I like, I think pipe drive. There's a couple of different ones out there. Um, Even just Airtable, really, really helpful. And that will start to make things clearer because most of the time these contacts are just scattered amongst millions of folders in Outlook and tons of emails and it's just an absolute mess. Um, the, the, the thing is though, if your practice is new, you actually don't have much organizing to do to get up to speed. You're just going back and grabbing those few contacts. It's a lot more challenging if you've been in practice for 10 years and you realized, oh, I have just let this stuff all accumulate like a big mess. Now it starts to get into more of a bit more of a task to get that stuff organized. But um, but actual tips about, you know, who should you network with? I guess that's a question of obviously, um, obviously do they interact with the kind of clients that you're looking for now? Like maybe, maybe not all the people that you've worked with in the past work with, maybe they worked with the type of client you wanted in the past and that's not who you want now, but yeah. identifying those people that work with that right kind of prospect, um, is you, you, you'll get an idea for who that is. Maybe it's, 
maybe it's a supplier who sells the most expensive stuff <laughs> that that you've had the you've had the opportunity to work with on a couple of projects but maybe that's a good person to speak to because they're working with a lot of you know bigger budget clients or you know whatever um but i th- i think that can be a big factor i often find Builders are particularly useful because they're one of the first people in the residential space. They're actually approached probably more often than, than mm-hmm. architects are, to be honest. Um, people will quite often reach out to a builder first for advice. Um, but the same thing goes for people in the real estate and property industry, buyers, agents, uh, brokers, real estate agents. They can also be extremely valuable referral sources if you maintain relationships with them. Absolutely. So, so circling back to... Yeah. We've we've got a, a good consistent email marketing strategy in place with a, a campaign. What kinds of calls to action are would you suggest people put into their email marketing, or or not to do that type of direct response? So yeah, so it's a, it's it's an interesting call. So I find a lot of the time the just the just the action of sending the email does the job. Um, it's that amazing little reminder that jogs people into action. I think most of the time people are not, they're not, you know, not considering your business. They're just distracted by something else. It's Mm -hmm. not their number one priority at most times. And so the email itself is the call to action. It's like, oh, I need to do that. And I I do need to contact this architect. So I find that one of the most standard call to actions in any email is just writing them in a way that you can even clearly indicate at the bottom, please reply to this email. Like just reply. You can, if you'd like to contact me, reply to this email because you'd be surprised how many people don't realize that if you reply to a newsletter, it actually goes to the person. Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, Some people think, and I think often because we send out a lot of our emails from our info at address or hello at address this and the way the emails look, it just doesn't indicate reply to me. Um, And so what I try to do is encourage my clients to make their emails look as email-ish as possible to clear out all the kind of newslettery clutter right. because people aren't really going to engage with an email that looks like, you know, their local airline or their credit card company sent it. Um, but if it's like an email from Dave that looks the same as the emails Dave normally sends that has email signature, the only difference is a little unsubscribe link down the bottom. And it says, Hey, reply to me if something like this has happened to you, whatever, like as a call to action, then mm-hmm. that can actually be really, that could really, really, really work. Um, so I think replies are always a good one. But if you've got anything that you want people to like sign up for, which I think, I think with things like that, it's usually it should usually be something that has like a deadline, mm-hmm. um, a date or a time. Maybe you're going to do like a Zoom webinar to talk about your latest project, or you're going to maybe even just you know when you guys get out of lockdown, you're going to do some outdoor friendly uh, ventilated gathering at, at the local <laughs> pub standing very apart from one another. And you might set a date and time for that and go, we're doing ventilated that at that ga- time. The so. Ventilated party. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Sign up for the vent- RSVP for the ventilated party. So like, I think people need something that's kind of, that has that little bit of motivation built into it. I think if you just sort of throw out the kind of, you know, cold fish hands, handshake of, Oh, we're always available to take on new projects. Get in touch if you know you've got something like that. Again, I've seen it work. Clients have always proven me wrong with that, but mm-hmm. I, I I usually want to take the more kind of the gentler approach because we just don't want to be seen to be, you know, doing too much marketing, right? No one likes that. So yeah, usually sure. usually best to kind of keep it a little bit more subtle. Got it. Great. And going back to the idea then of of content marketing. And you're, you see, you're, you're kind of continually, you've got a, a, an effective strategy, email strategy campaign happening in place. You're being consistent in it. What are the different forms of content marketing that architects can be engaging with? What is content marketing? And how does it differ Con- from the, the other types of marketing that we've been discussing? Yeah, it's interesting. So I think there's, first on that point about what's what's the difference. I think content is where you're working on something that's, a little bit bigger. It's got more length to it. I know that's not like the textbook definition of content marketing, but you know, I separate it for architects from project-based marketing, which I think is a category of its own where the content is your finished buildings and the photographs thereof, right? Like I think that's should be an entire like siloed section of your marketing. Right. Um, 
then there's kind of those short posts, those tweets, those captions. They're not really content marketing. I mean, you're just kind of, you're saying a little thing, right? You might make a LinkedIn post where you just go, you know what? I'm sick and tired of planners in the city of London making me do this, this, and this. Shouldn't we stand up and fight for our rights architects? And everyone likes it and comments. That's kind of content marketing, but it's not really. I think content marketing and the forms that it takes are like, you know, writing blog posts, they don't have to be super long, but, you know, blog posts where there's, there's an, you're starting to break down maybe more of a, maybe like a mini essay in a way. There's, there's a point that's being made or there's an idea that's being kind of untangled through the process of writing about it. Um, a podcast and the videos of that, like this is content marketing. I'm, you're doing content right, marketing right now, as am I in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of thing, conversations, recording those could be interesting strategies. Video is challenging, but you know, maybe it's not even you making the content marketing. Perhaps you might decide to make a short film about one of your projects and you commission a videographer or collaborate with somebody to help you do that. Um, and then roughly speaking, I guess, images, we're covering kind of like all four, like, I don't know, typologies of different types of content here. The last remaining one is images. I would say that, you know, maybe, maybe generating those renders that, that all those, you know, that really amazing visualization could be a form of content marketing as well. But, you know, I usually I'm thinking typically writing with, Mm -hmm. with most of my clients because um, it seems to be the one that, fits in best with the lifestyle of being an architect that, you know, you will get some time to maybe reflect and do some writing at some point. And it's Mm -hmm. something that you can work on incrementally. It's very, very hard to incrementally work on a podcast, (laughs) Yeah, you know, 20 minutes here and there. It it makes it quite on and it's off. Yeah. (laughs) It's, it's on and off. Like if you can sit down kind of distraction free for an hour or two, then audio or video might be a really good option for you. I mean, you kind of need that for writing anyway, but but writing's usually pretty good, I think, is good kind of good kind of middle ground. Um, so, yeah, content marketing is really basically just that longer stuff where you're really, you know, you're creating, you're creating. I hate to use the word content, but you're creating an original piece of content that will hopefully have some substance to it. So, and and what's what's the kind of nature of the content, and how do you make it so that it's not, it just becomes a a, t- a time suck, if you like. Or is it? That's, yeah. just, that's part and parcel of it. That it. You know, creating content, it does take time. It does take a lot of energy. There isn't, there isn't a quick fix. Or are there, or are there strategies which can kind of speed it yeah. up? Yeah, like. definitely. I, I find that if you're, if, you're finding, if you're finding, let's say you take writing, for example, if you're finding that kind of really, really challenging and you really don't want to do it, you've probably picked the wrong topics. Um, right. And oftentimes I see the mistakes that a lot of architects make with their content marketing is that they're really just focusing on the kind of content con- content or topics that they think, you know, will rank in Google or something or will get them traffic or really directly relate to um, almost like too ideally fitting in with what they hope will happen short term in terms of getting a new client. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Like, and I, and I, and I, I don't discourage this when clients do it because, you know, I think it, I think anytime they're motivated to, to start writing for the first time, that's a good thing. And I want to kind of let them work on that. But, you know, I've seen the same articles a million times, you know, top five reasons that you should hire an architect, um, you know, why you should, why you should use an architect for your next, uh, you know, loft conversion, right? We've seen these kinds of things a lot of times mm-hmm. and it's, it's way too closely connected to what they want, where they're going on one hand, I want somebody who's looking for an architect. So I'm going to write an article that most directly fits with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Instead, I think it's better to just focus on maybe those shorter, tighter ideas that you would just like to express to, again, to clients, hopefully so that they've read it before they've walked in the front door. So those can be, quite contained, quite small. You don't have to take on a really, really big topic. Um, And, you know, if you're just writing really, I guess, from the heart in a way um, or writing something, writing about something that you've already discussed with a million clients a million times before, it really, it shouldn't be too bad. 
particularly if you're only aiming for a pretty small word length. I think some, some really good article, like the kind of starter articles that, you know, you could just put the whole copy paste, all the text into an, into an email and send it. And it doesn't even need to be a big thing about where does it go on your website and whatnot. Cause you really are using email as your main channel, but it would go mm-hmm. on your website as well. But that might be like 600 words, you know, which isn't a lot. I mean, once you actually get writing, you'll find that that's actually, you know, that's actually really easy to produce a piece of content like that. It's yeah. not so much time. It's about picking the right topic. What's something that I actually really want to talk about that gets me a little bit heated or pissed off, <laughs> you know, yeah. like that, that can, that could be a really good place to start or, you know, only maybe that's, you know, one way of looking at it. Another way is to go like, what do I really love? What am I excited about? And just don't forget about trying to connect it directly with your marketing goals. Like, it doesn't have to revolve around convincing somebody to hire you. It should have nothing to do with getting somebody to hire you or hoping somebody will um, completely put that aside. And it will completely open up doors to a whole bunch of like other options for you to just write about things and just, just trust, trust the marketing people when they tell you that it will work for you in terms of people coming to you faster and more of them when they read content like that, that's honest that's yeah. authentic to the point from somebody who, who somebody who has something to say and did it in a manner that was, you know, relatively short and respectful of people's time. There are certain situations, you know, for other reasons that you'll want to write longer content, more information based content, you know, and I'm not, I'm not putting SEO aside. There's definitely uses for that, but most topics aren't SEO suitable. There's mm-hmm. like a very narrow range of topics that make sense for SEO where you will do a you know, a bigger post, like the ultimate guide to renovating in London. Okay. That's going to be, that's going to be the big SEO project where you might write 4,000 <laughs> words. That's not going to be a 500 word little think piece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so it's always about making sure you're matching the content with the, with the topic and really what you're trying to get across. Brilliant. And that's a very, really insightful way of looking at um, writing, writing content in terms of kind of writing about your your practice. Um, and often, you know, you mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk earlier and one of his sort of strategies is this idea of document don't, don't create. What is your thoughts on that? And what does that mean for you? I think, I think that can be really like a really useful strategy. And when I, when I see clients kind of taking on like embodying that idea of going, you know, I don't really have to think, sort of separately here. I don't have to come up with ideas for posts. Mm-hmm. I just have to kind of reflect on what's been happening maybe during my week or over the last two weeks and then kind of give an account of that. I think that that can be really good. It just depends on which aspect of things you focus on is going to kind of dictate, you know, what type of content you end up producing. Because on the one hand, I think the natural temptation for a lot of architects when they're thinking about documenting versus creating, and I mean kind of creating from thin air versus documenting what's going on, um, they're really drawn to like what happened on site, right? What the latest construction development is. And that can, that can be very, very interesting, particularly if a firm, ultimately that's what their DNA is. If they see themselves as a very, very construction oriented firm and they're like, you know, they revel in the, like the dirty little details of, you know, what, yeah. what's that wheelbarrow up to this week? You know, they really, <laughs> really like that kind of thing. <laughs> Then you know, go for it because <laughs> that's genius. Gonna, I love that. <laughs> where's gonna, the wheelbarrow gonna, this week? <laughs> where's the wheelbarrow this week? What's in the wheelbarrow? Let's find out, right? Like, like that's going to be really, really interesting. And and they're gonna they're gonna attract a type of client where you know that's going to be like a shared interest, right? But um, so only do that if it feels right. But but document don't create. I think you know even the examples I was mentioning earlier, they're examples of document don't create because you're thinking mm-hmm. back to particular conversations or frustrations that you've had to deal with, with clients, things where you've had to educate with them, um, possibly even, you know, um, possibly even issues that you wish you could have on reflection, you know, a lesson that you've learned, you know, um, maybe again, I, I think whichever sort of aspect of your day-to-day practice you, t- you try to reflect upon is going to really color the, the sort of the theme of your content. So it's, it's worthwhile to kind of take a step back and think about that and go, you know, what kind of firm are we? Are we very much a client communication type firm? Are we very much a construction oriented firm? Are we a, you know, I've met some architects who really see themselves as 
I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fountain of experience and wisdom and I've seen all the, I've seen all the mistakes made a million times over. And I see my main value add for my clients as saving them from the trials and tribulations that, that come with the construction process. Clearly if, a, if an architect kind of explained that to me immediately, I'd be thinking, well, every, honestly, every article you should be writing should be here is a common mistake that I see made in the construction process. Mm. And here's my, you know, solutions or what I would do differently. That, that's really interesting. I speak to a lot of architects and sometimes when an architect says, you know, we've done over 300 built projects and mm. you're like, you need to be talking about that because that's yeah, extraordinary. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you know a thing or two at this point. <laughs> that, that's extraordinary. And that, that's, you know, I think a lot of architects yep. sometimes forget how much mastery they actually have in their craft. Um, and to be able to just pull out that experience. It's, you know, there's people walking around with 25, 30 years of just doing the same sorts of project typologies and the, the content that they could create is extraordinary. Yeah, I know. Like, I think that's particularly true when I, I come across a firm that has maybe they maybe they have been kind of specialized you know and and sometimes these are the firms that feel like all hope is lost for their marketing because mm -hmm. you know it might be that that firm that practice that has been doing has been doing you know medical and hospital and spaces since you know 1983 and they only got a website five years ago and they don't have an instagram account and you know you meet them and you're like because they're because the work that they do, you know, is not inherently marketable in the yeah. current environment. You know, it just doesn't make sense. It's not going to win many design awards. It's not going to be on the cover of a magazine. So they're usually the people where they're like, oh, you know, marketing. How, what could we possibly do? Maybe you know, sponsor a doctor's convention or something. What could we possibly do? But you think about how much expertise they've developed. As you're saying, I mean, what they would have so much knowledge. That, that their target market would just be, you know, kind of crying out for. And there's some great examples of that, actually. I mean, I, I recently did an episode of my podcast with James Murray from Tandem Studio in Melbourne. And they're, they're, a, they're a medium-sized practice that has done work across a whole bunch of different sectors. But him and his partner decided to start a single podcast series on kind of conversations about public markets, like, you know, farmer's markets where people get their food from and about talking about the architecture, but just talking more broadly about that sector of the economy and of the mm -hmm. built environment and some of its challenges and COVID and what the future of these, of these places looks like. And, and they were drawing on the experience of probably being, you know, one of the most unique practices in Australia in that they had been involved in designing, I think six or seven different you know, major public markets around the country. And we don't have that many public markets. So these guys had somehow gotten, you know, into all of them or a lot of them. So they had a, they had a really unique point of difference to look to for their content marketing. So I think, I think certain types of content marketing really favor the specialist um, in a sense, but yeah. you don't have to be, you don't have to be a specialist. I mean, um, even just being a generalist, I think you can have, you can, you can have content that, is not completely proprietary or unique to your practice. You know, maybe you're not the only architect that's had to explain to a client that like, you know, it's worthwhile to do X, Y, and Z when the client doesn't want to. Um, but you, you will still be writing about it from your own point of view. And like for one thing and for another thing, you're probably the only architect that's ever written a piece of content on it anywhere in the history of the internet. I, I pick any issue that you deal with on a day-to-day -day business basis and good luck finding somebody who's talked about that online anywhere at any point in our industry. So it's all really, there's a lot of, um, you know, green fields kind of territory out there for you to pretty much take on, you know, almost any topic that you're kind of interested in and have a go at it. And odds are that it will probably stand out. Brilliant. Brilliant. What are some of the tools that you recommend architects using in their content marketing, email marketing? I, I, I refer back to your part of your website, the architecture stash, which I think is one of the most brilliant collections of Thank you. different parts of soft, different software that architects can use in all sorts of areas from project management to marketing, um, 
to you know kind of cash management etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. what are some of the tools that you think are that can really just make life easier with with these things that we've been discussing today i i'm glad you asked <laughs> <laughs> i i love like tools and apps like sometimes i i, I have these fantasies that i'm just gonna like I'm going to become a, like a productivity coach. Cause I feel like half the time I'm like productivity has become my passion and I want to pursue it a bit more, but I love talking to my clients about like tools that will help them sort of speed up what they're doing. Mm. And, and in the content marketing space, like uh, if we're talking writing, I think the absolute first thing is that if you don't see yourself as a really good writer, you're probably better off sort of speaking your thoughts or, or, or sort of, mock having that conversation, you know, maybe, maybe now it's your, you know, your daughter is playing the client and then you're discussing it with her and recording that. And there's a really, there's a really great, um, there's a really great app out there or a really good service called rev rev.com. And they, they do extremely accurate, um, hand typed transcriptions of any audio file for something like a dollar a minute or whatever it is. And it's, it's amazing to have that conversation where you've basically gotten it all out and then you get that back and you can begin that process of just editing it. Sometimes it's a lot easier, I think, to get you past that point of just having that blank page, Mm -hmm. uh, which can be quite frightening. We're not always sure, like, how do you start writing something? That's super helpful for doing that. So transcription is like just an absolute um, easy tool. If you're doing anything that's kind of like SEO oriented with your your, um, writing, if we're still talking about writing, There's a really great app or program called Ink that a couple of my clients have really enjoyed using. I think it's called Ink Studio. And it has these extremely intelligent recommendations for how to approach your article so that it actually stands a chance of doing well in search results. So Um, it will it will scan you you put in what you want to rank for, like, you know, loft conversions in North London. And how good am I in like tailoring this to the UK audience anyway? <laughs> and the, you, you put that into ink and it will actually search the, the, all, the, all the pieces of content that are currently ranking for that. It'll mm-hmm. analyze each of them and it will give you recommendations. It'll say, your article should be this long. You should be, you should be having these topics covered in your article. It, it really starts to give you some great advice, which I, can, I think can be helpful on that, on that productivity um, side of things. There's also one more app and this is something I've just kind of recently started using. It's called Descript and Descript is cool. I think everyone in content, I can see you nodding around. So you're obviously kind of across it, but it's another one of, it's a, it's a transcription app similar to Rev, but you drop in your audio, your video. So say you've recorded, you know, you and your co-director have recorded a conversation about public markets. You drop that into the app and it will transcribe it and show you all the text. And that's quite cool. But the amazing thing is, is if you start deleting paragraphs or deleting words or getting rid of the deleting all the ums and the ahs and the okay and, you know, you knows, it will edit the video and edit the audio in real time. It'll actually cut it together for you. So you don't have to know how to edit audio or edit video to get like a pretty good job done. It can do automatic things like removing all the ums or you could look for a certain type of word. It's, it's like really incredible. So that's another tool that I think can make it a lot more productive for audio and video as well. So those would be like three that I would, you know, Amazing. definitely, definitely get into. Amazing. And, and in terms of kind of email marketing, what would your be sort of recommendations for? Email marketing, I'm very, very torn uh, at the moment. I've traditionally said MailChimp. Mm-hmm. I've recently, I've recently started going more towards ConvertKit, which is kind of a very disruptive new email brand that does a really, really good job. And it's got a good ethos and it's simpler. It's a lot easier to use than MailChimp. I think MailChimp is just overcomplicated to the max for what it, for who it's for. It's for ordinary small business people. And I'm like the marketing expert person and I get lost in there half the time trying to show my clients how to do something. It's so, it's very hard to use. So ConvertKit was kind of, I'm drawn that way. But then again, MailChimp is kind of considered the standard. And particularly if your practice is using a Squarespace website, you're really going to want to have MailChimp because it will just connect directly to your Squarespace website. Whereas trying to get from your contact forms and your newsletter form to ConvertKit 
you need to sign up for another tool. It's going to cost, it's another thing you have to subscribe for. And it's, it's a big investment. So for most people, I think MailChimp's the way to go. And MailChimp obviously has got quite a, a good set of features just which are for free. And yeah, then it's got decent ones, which you've, if you go for the paid for services. I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pay for stuff guy. <laughs> like I, I think most, most architects will be as well, even at the lower tiers where you don't have that many people on your email list. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that they put a big sort of, you know, stinky looking MailChimp logo at the bottom of your emails, if you're not paying for it. I mean, that's enough to get you paying, you know, yeah, 15 a few quid, quid a month or whatever. Exactly. exactly. Um, you know, I, I think, and think in the scheme of things, you can be a pretty, pretty full you can do pretty much everything in digital marketing with you know a couple hundred pounds a month worth of tools all Mm -hmm. all together and that's being pretty you know pretty lax in terms of paying for a lot of things that in each given month you may not be using necessarily but they're going to be there um so look i think on i i I think pay for good quality tools is often the way to go um yeah so so pay for mailchimp i even think the, the tool that I mentioned that can connect those other apps together. Even, I'm leaning towards MailChimp just so you don't have to pay for that, but I'm going to contradict myself and say Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R is an incredible tool. If you're working with me, I'm going to strongly encourage you to sign up for that and it connects all these different apps together. So, because honestly, just on that, the biggest barrier in my client's marketing is not that they don't have the right strategy and that their message isn't clear enough and all these things. It's that they don't have enough time. Mm. Firstly, they don't spend enough time on marketing full stop. Like we want to change that, get you actually spending time on it, but everything in there is so, if you don't have these tools, everything in there is tedious. It takes so long. And quite often with marketing, it's these little things that, you know, they are just five minutes. They are just 10 minutes. And you go, why do I need a tool? It just takes me five minutes, 10 minutes, but they add up big time and you'll wish you had that time back to do something with over time. So spend money on any marketing tool that can save you time. It will always be worthwhile. Brilliant. Brilliant. And what are your thoughts on a lot of the kind of funnel building tools, like having a landing page and actually kind of, you know, almost bypassing the need for a website in many ways, so that you have, you know, you've got your Facebook advertise, as advertisement that directly goes into some sort of digital funnel like click funnels. Then that takes you to some subscription page or even a purchase page. Do those work yeah. for architects? Yeah, they definitely do. But like, I just have hard, such a hard time convincing small practices that they should spend, you know, 150 pounds a month on a, on a landing page generator. <laughs> They're just so expensive. Um, like, you know, I, unbounce for example is one that i kind of like and i think if you're if you were doing any serious advertising like if you're if you're a practice that was a little bit more established Mm -hmm. and particularly particularly if you're running a decent chunk of facebook ads or instagram ads or absolutely google ads because google ads you are paying an absolute fortune for each of those clicks you know it you might be lucky and it might be three pounds a click it could be 10, 15 pounds a click if you're targeting an area that there's also there's a lot of competition for. Um, so when it when it gets to that point, in the scheme of things, if you're spending a thousand pounds a month on online advertising, you're absolutely better off having a designed fit for purpose sort of landing page that will be generated by a service that provides these landing changes that just, they supplement, they sit, they sit aside from your website. Um, they're not, so you don't have to reconfigure your website because mm-hmm. chances are your website was built to look good, show your portfolio and, um, and get people maybe to your about page or your contact page. It's not really designed to, you know, get people really going towards a, towards a lead form where they're going to give you an email address in exchange for something. But so look, if you're doing that big investment, absolutely. But if you're not, and I do this with almost all of my clients, if they're running any lead generation type Facebook or Instagram ad campaign, we will just make a new page that doesn't have to be anywhere in the menu or the footer, no links anywhere in your website pointing to this page. In Mm -hmm. Squarespace, it would just be a little unlinked page. And we're just going to delete everything every irrelevant thing off that page. We'll get, we'll get rid of the menu. We'll get rid of the footer. We'll just make it like a clean blank slate. 
Yeah. And then just create some content on there that addresses the thing that we're trying to get people to sign up for. So I had a client over the summer, over your winter, who was working on a, a very like a beach house focused campaign because they wanted to explore more of this holiday home market. And so they put together this kind of beach house starter pack PDF thing and started running some ads that were kind of describing it and getting people interested in it. They created a page on their Squarespace site where it was just a picture of the cover, a little bit of text describing you know, what it is and then a form, nothing else, like nothing else. There was a link down the bottom at the very bottom that said, you know, click here to see the rest of our website, which took mm-hmm. them to the rest of the website if they wanted to look at that. But the right. only thing that you could interact with on this page was just that form. And so, yeah, I really think that you should do that for any type of like online ad thing, just because, um, you know, that's going to really improve that sign up rate, just taking away all the distractions. So that that's going to be new for a lot of architects, this idea that, you know, you create that page for a sign up form, but it's a good way to go. Um, I've also, you know, seen seen certain practices that have a really clear idea behind what their email list is about, right? For example, say a practice might be doing they, their main call to action for their email list rather than just saying, hey, join our newsletter. It might say, get our seven part series on how to renovate your home in 2021. I just added that on for no reason, not 2021, <laughs> how to renovate your home. Yeah, doesn't matter. Um, yeah. And that's like pretty cool, right? But, you know, they want to be able to put that around the site, but they kind of want to explain more about what's in there to get people's interest. And you don't want to be doing that on like every page on the site. So you might set up another one of these kind of clean pages that just talks about like, here's what's in this seven day series. And then there's a form and it's got bullet points and explains all of the different, you know, parts to it. So sometimes those forms are, you know, really useful if, if you are trying to get people to sign, to sign up for something. Amazing. Brilliant. Brilliant. Dave, that has been an absolute whirlwind deep dive of the (laughs) wonders of online marketing. You've been so clear and concise and strategic with um, like actually, you know, really giving some really good practical advice here that architects can be um, implementing. So um, thank you. Thank you so, so much. And um, I'd love to have you back at some point. And and, Oh my God, I'd love to. I, and, and do this did again. I pass the audition? I, I want to be a regular, <laughs> I want to be like a regular, you know, co-host, please. But yeah, is, thank you no, so much. Really, really wonderful. I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions from our, from our listeners and from our audience as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. No worries. Thank you very much, mate. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.